so we should probably get started uh, you know it, it's really wonderful to see uh, you know get a larger and larger audience in our grand round series uh, particularly I'm so glad to see so many trainees now um, and look forward to seeing more of you and uh, and you know it, and we are in for such a treat actually uh, because uh, today's speaker Dr. Caroline Eaton uh, it's such a great a pleasure for me to introduce her she's right now the professor of behavioral health and, and forensic psychology at uh, Rochester Institute of Technology she is local. She received her bachelor's degree at RIT first, and then later she obtained her psychology in the University of Connecticut, and also got later got a clinical psychology uh, degree also at the UMass as well. She did her postdoc fellowship in Alcohol Research Center at UConn, and later also did her research fellowship at Yale as well, where she stayed as a faculty member uh, rising up to the rank of assistant professor and associate professor until 2012. So there's a couple of years that we overlapped at, at, at Yale. And, uh, and uh, she, she was recruited to RIT in 2012, and she's been a full professor of foreign, uh, forensic psychology since then. Uh, she's also been the uh, chief psychologist for pre- and postdoc training at RIT. Done wonderful work related to education of psychologists around the region. And she's also the director of the Personalized Healthcare Technology Leadership as well. Um, she's also the PI of the NIH UG3 grant, which is a $4.7 million grant titled a randomized controlled trial of digital self-guided avatar assisted CBT platform to treat addiction. And when I heard and learned about this grant, I really saw the future. Uh, you know, people, you know, when people talked about how AI will be the largest behavioral health provider in five years, it didn't really down on me until I saw some of her work. Uh, she has received numerous uh, external grants from, you know, the institutes such as NIH, and she's also received many awards over the years, wrote about 100 about a hundred articles over the years and also very important most important of all mentored many students trainees and faculty members in in the area of addiction psychiatry so it's a great pleasure to welcome dr caroline easton uh, thank you dr lee it's it's really an honor to be here and i really appreciate the invite and Again, an honor to be here to present to you. I also want to thank Dr. Silverstein, Zipora, Mary Lee, and Gladys for helping organize this. Um, appreciate it. So I'm going to get started. I believe there's some disclosure slides I have to go through with you. Um, this is the, the topic will be digital therapy, uh, deploying CBT therapy in addiction psychiatry. That's, this is the title within Psychiatry Grand Rounds. Um, I will be giving the presentation. Uh, the learning objectives are that addiction and family violence co-occur, that digital, ther digital therapies are, can be a nice um, vehicle to deploy evidence-based care, and that digital therapeutics and biomarker research are really going to be what's needed to advance the psychiatric field. And then uh, I don't have any conflicts of interest on the financial disclosure, so, and also um, the accreditation certificate statements are here. And I believe there's a QR code that you complete at the end to fill out a survey. So again, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, so I will be describing a, the use of an avatar-assisted digital therapy treatment. It's called Rich CBT. And I want to thank. It's I haven't done this in a vacuum. It's actually with a team, a uh, really dedicated team of researchers: Dr. Crane, Burberry, Kalahassee, San Giorgio, and our project coordinator. Coordinator Jillian Cook. Um, I was hired in 2012, but we started a predoctoral internship program in 2016. We're accredited a year later. We had four interns. We now have 24 interns that we recruit across the United States that uh, come to do this like residency with us for a year. And they're out in this community and they're uh, 
about a third of them stay in the Rochester community, and we're training them on digital therapeutics and digital tools in the field of addiction and forensic psych. Uh, they're a very diverse group of interns that are working hard. The research team is a multidisciplinary group that has helped build this avatar platform with me. So it's the digital platform in and of itself uh, is in collaboration with a professor at RIT who's in computer science who has expertise in artificial intelligence and machine learning. Dr. Zhang, who is developing as we speak wearables for biomarker research and Mehdi Mercoli, who is a cybersecurity um, software engineer, and Professor Smith, who uh, has a lot of expertise in UI UX, and then our uh, licensed clinicians. So we're a multidisciplinary team. Um, just to give you a little background, um, I'm focusing on addiction and family violence because I see them as two negative peas in a pod. They sort of they highly co-occur, they go together, so many problems can be created if we're not treating them. So that's the focus today is on those two maladaptive um, behaviors. Um, both SUDS and family violence have escalated uh, during the pandemic. A total of 700 billion uh, are spent uh, in costs that are related to the adverse and negative side effects of addiction. Family violence is also very, very costly to society. Three trillion of the costs of family violence consequences relate to uh, psychiatric care needs, medical care needs, legal costs, loss of work productivity. So it's very costly. So we, we definitely need to infuse the field with more therapeutics to help treat this population. The psychiatric addiction and the negative social consequences um, are devastating to families, especially children who are in the home and they're witnessing this, the SUDS and the family violence. The literature shows that they're, they're observing and witnessing this. Literature shows that they have, um, if, if there is an intervention for them, that they themselves will have psychiatric related disorders, early onset of substance use, and they themselves will become a victim or an offender of intimate partner violence as, um, as they get older. There is a robust link between addiction and family violence. Um, also, um, I refer to it as intimate partner violence. 50% of individuals with substance use disorders also have co-occurring family violence. So if you were to go into an outpatient, so these, these publications came out in the early 2000s, so 1999, 2000, pretty much has been replicated to date. So if you were to go into outpatient addiction treatment and ask those clients if they have family conflict or family violence going on in the relationships, they will say yes. If you go to an anger management group for clients that are having problems with family violence and you ask them about their substance use, about 50 to 67% will say they're abusing or dependent on a substance. So they highly co-occur and they do cause other psychiatric and medical related problems. Research has definitely identified skill deficits among substance using um, clients with co-occurring intimate partner violence um, linked to how to navigate conflicts, how to, how to manage their anger. And research by a group of, known as Mar uh, Murphy and Eckert have found that CBT shows promise in decreasing aggressive behaviors if you're just working with a group of clients that are having a hard time with their anger and aggression. So I'm gonna first present some of the research that has to do with the foundation. This is like human administered CBT that is the foundation of building the digital avatar CBT platform. So some of our earlier trials, even predating the slide that I have up, occurred in 2000. It was a randomized controlled trial, and it was focusing on alcohol-dependent clients that were, they were male clients that were referred by the court because they were having problems um, with substance use and, and managing their anger. And um, to be in the study, it was just alcohol dependence, no other substance use. And so they met criteria, and probably two or three weeks into the trial, their urine toxicology screens, 50% of them were positive for cocaine or marijuana. So the next trial, we realized we really need to focus on the most prevalent substance use that we were seeing in the population, which was alcohol and cocaine. And alcohol in and of itself can lead to aggressive behaviors and disinhibition, but alcohol combined with cocaine can create a substance known as cocaethylene, and animal studies have shown a lot of aggression 
in animal studies when you give coke ethylene. So we thought it was very, you know, pertinent to this population that alcohol and cocaine be the targeted substances in our next randomized controlled trial. So we had this hypothesis that if we, at the time, it was the, the court system or other hospital settings, they would refer clients, they have these co-occurring problems to different clinics, and there was like hard to coordinate the care between the different clinics. So it was like, why not have an integrated program, an integrated care within each session for these clients um, so they didn't have to go across town um, for the different treatments. So we had this hypothesis that we would use cognitive behavioral therapy as our vehicle to target both substance use and anger management in each session across 12 weeks of treatment. And we would hypothesize that we'd have better treatment outcomes versus just targeting the substance use alone and cleaning them up. Well, maybe just doing that, they actually get better and maybe they'll have similar treatment outcomes. But we hypothesized that the integrated group would do better. We chose drug counseling as our evidence-based addiction treatment because the standard of care for clients like this would be to go to a large group, um, psychoeducational group. And those psychoeducational groups known as Duluth derivatives or models, uh, meta-analytic reviews have shown that the effect sizes were close to zero. And we felt ethically, since there was high rates of uh, reoffending and relapsing, that we wanted to use a comparison or a control group that actually improved their care so that we wouldn't put anyone at risk. So the this, this study I'm going to present uh, some findings on to you is human-administered CBT versus drug counseling. The CBT focuses on two maladaptive behaviors is if substance use in and of itself can lead to aggressive behavior and anger and negative mood can also be uh, trigger relapse to substance use. So how they, in, they interact with each other. So we want to do an integrated model versus just cleaning them up. So we hypothesize that the integrated CBT model would have increased number of sessions, a decrease in substance use, and a decrease in aggressive behaviors. And so in the study, we. They were screened, they were given a uh, informed consent, they were actually given an informed consent quiz to make sure they were truly informed and they had to get 100 on it. So they, they would take it as many times as they needed until they got 100 to realize that, you know, they could drop out at any time. It was a study, it was um, um, there to know what would happen if they dropped out of treatment. And then they were randomized to either the integrated model of care or the drug counseling condition, the control condition. So they all had 12 sessions and one-on-one -on -one 60 minute therapy. And what was different was focusing on integration of care versus just substance use. So the content was different as a result. And then we looked at how they did after 12 weeks of treatment and a three month follow-up. Uh, so 75 were eligible and 63 started and were com and completed. And there was an earned randomization that was done prior to randomizing them that controlled for their severity of substance use and the severity of their aggressive behavior. So at baseline, the p-values, um, basically nothing was significant uh, at baseline between the two groups. We also, what's important to know is we controlled for part like average waking hours with their partner so that if they did use substances or had a conflict just that everybody was the same in terms of number of waking hours with their partner so it didn't seem like maybe there was it looked inflated for one group because no one was around to get aggressive or angry at um, so we wanted to make sure we controlled for that um, so the mean age of this population was 39 male participants and uh, there was uh, um, diversity across uh, uh, race and ethnicity. 79% had a high school degree. Uh, greater than two thirds uh, were divorced or separated, but they had a partner. Um, and 83% were employed full time. Mostly this group, what we gleaned from the addiction severity index was that uh, they were the working poor. Uh, number of rests on average was three. And what we found out is that the CBT integrated group had significantly less positive breathalyzer screens and significantly less urine 
positive screens for cocaine than the drug counseling group. We also found that on the days of drinking, that the drug counseling group had significantly more episodes of aggressive behavior than the integrated CBT group. So there's something about the integrated CBT group that was uh, moderating the effects of aggression when there was a slip to using substances. And it's not a surprise because we were teaching them skill sets that if they did have a slip to substance use, it didn't necessarily mean they had to slip to aggressive behavior. Here's how to manage that healthy timeouts. And they were given coping skills to manage that. And then at the three month follow up, so after treatment was completed at three month follow up, we found that the drug counseling group had on average um, a little over nine episodes of aggressive uh, um, behaviors compared to the CBT integrated group that didn't have any reported uh, aggression. I should also note too that this population, we call it um, the typology is a family only, meaning it's substance users that have had isolated incidents of family violence. So we excluded borderline dysphoric typology where they're sort of harassing and stalking. We excluded a sociopathic typology group of substance users where they're violent and outside the home and they have severe violence. They were excluded from the study. So this was a typology of substance users where there was family violence, but um, it was lower level sort of, not that it's lower level, but they had conflict in the home that um, they were showing remorse and they wanted treatment. Uh, so why digital therapies? Like why, um, why even do this? So basically we know from substance use that there's already some digital treatments that were used back in 2004 to 2008. I'm not sure if people are familiar with CBT for CBT by Kathy, Kathy Carroll. Um, that is a, a digital CBT format that has been shown to be very effective uh, with substance users at leading to decreases in substance use. <clears throat> and what this group has done is they created a platform where it, there's like uh, narrators, uh, they're like actors that are like filmed and they're showing substance users different vignettes of what can lead, lead to a trigger to use substance. Like here's some possible ways you can use problem solving skills by showing like movie, little movie clips and then having the um, clients try to rate what are triggers and what kind of skills to use. So it's really more of a movie based way of educating and informing, but they've had very um, excellent effects with CBT for CBT and it's primarily just focuses on substance use. And then the literature suggests, and this is a very touchy area, um, that participants in intimate partner violence treatment actually prefer interacting with avatars and digital platforms over human by Fried, Fried et al's group. And this is preliminary research, but their, their reporting was that the clients felt like they were less judged by the avatar than a human when they're reporting sensitive information about uh, the relationships. And um, so that was some of their uh, initial reports from their research. Um, using a traditional non-digitized CBT approach in an integrated way with suds and aggressives does show promise. So that's why, why not take it to the next level and have the avatar be able to like deploy the different coping skills for these two maladaptive behaviors that are co-occurring. And these platforms can be very low cost, easily downloadable, fast, user-friendly, um, and they can be used in homes uh, on people's devices. So they're scalable across uh, a smartphone, a tablet, a laptop, um, and they can be accessible for care for those that wouldn't otherwise be able to afford it, don't have an insurance, or maybe can't drive to a clinic or a hospital setting. Can we improve treatment outcomes using advancements in technology? So we already know from meta-analytic reviews that CBT is has been found to be effective across numerous psychiatric substance use disorders, other medical and behavioral related um, symptomatology. So we know that the literature is there showing the science behind, you know, manualized evidence-based CBT is effective, um, the, the human administered versions and some of the early digital versions. So CBT makes a nice vehicle for change, behavioral change. 
and it's, it's the technology makes for ease of content to be deployed to the client. Research shows that clients that another reason why this is, um, you know, the rationale for digital therapy and why CBT is that research shows in the different randomized controlled trials that clients that practice their coping skills in between their therapy sessions actually have significant improvements in their substance use. Um, and that's like some old literature by Kathy Carroll from 2005 that's been replicated recently to 2014 by Dr. Kathy Burberry. And basically what Dr. Carroll found was that those clients that even just attempted to do their practice exercises or their coping skills did just as well as those that completed their coping skills versus clients that didn't do it at all. If they didn't do any of their coping skills in between therapy sessions, they had significantly more cocaine use and cocaine positive urines. It was replicated by, Keith, uh, by Cassie, Dr. Brewery, showing that with alcohol and cocaine use, um, if they did their practice, it was assigned and they did do their practice exercise, they had significantly more uh, positive treatment outcomes compared to those clients that didn't do the practice exercises or coping skills at all. So the point here is it's important for clients to practice, 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 uh, to try to use those coping skills to help them learn healthier ways to manage their unhealthy behaviors. So this is like traditional non-digital coping skill that, you know, in my day or, and still used to this day is like handouts for clients to take home and they're encouraged like to, like write these down or do these behaviors in between the therapy sessions and then bring them back to their therapist or their group therapy um, facilitator and to go over the content in group and more times than not the clients you know forget to bring their practice exercises back so the clinician just re like goes over these practice exercises with them so this is sort of the static uh, traditional CBT coping skills like self monitoring different coping skills that are giving on a uh, on a handout. Just keeping my eye on the time. Okay. Uh, so with the new digitized avatar assisted version. Uh, some of the assets of this type of platform would be you have an avatar that can be customizable to the clients liking it serves as a coach. Um, it can be user friendly. We can kind of right now you'll be I'll show you examples of it some video of the avatar platform, but we're already talking with our AI and computer science folks about smart avatar that can be very you can work on the facial expressions to make it very genuine and caring and um, relatable to clients, so we call that using AI for smart avatar uh, in the future. So that's important uh, just to point out, um, just to back up a little bit, that we actually, when we started building this platform in 2012, we actually worked with clients and asked them what they wanted. Did they want a human coach, a cartoon coach, or an avatar coach? And, and we, we published the results of this, um, this uh, alpha beta testing, which was they preferred the avatar coach um, and they said that they want what they wanted in it was to be genuine and relatable to them and and they also wanted to customize it to the race. Um, so we basically worked with clients throughout all the development of the, the digital platform. Um, so also so likable custom customizations that the clients can relate to and also what we built into it is self monitoring of symptom behavior so to what degree are you feeling are you craving substances to what degree are you feeling angry or depressed we build that into the platform so we can manage that week to week and also um, it's programmed for easy delivery and, and mobile flexibility and the mechanisms of action really are this version of cbt is more it's behaviorally oriented so role plays rehearsals coping skills um, based on operant conditioning like rewarding the positive behavior change social learning theory shaping the behavioral change and classical conditioning trying to understand what they've paired up in their environment that triggers them to use and continue using substances so uh, this is an example of what the platform looks like on ipads um, 
and it is, we just, um, it was about a week ago, it is available now in the app store. You just, you need a code to be able to use it. Um, so we're still like monitoring that out. Um, for younger clients, uh, they do want mobile versions for their phone. So technology, as I mentioned before, based CBT has already been shown to be effective. We know the avatar assists from some of Gordon et al's work uh, have been linked to reducing substance use and increasing preparedness and recognizing problem behaviors. And utilizing technology reduces the possibility of clients forgetting or losing their self-monitoring charts or uh, practice exercises, flushing. So it leads to uh, session compliance with their homework. So I can show, uh, this is just basically when a, a clinician works with the patient. It's a very brief demographic form they fill out, but I just wanted to show you how that looks on front end, like a code is given. And this is all de-identified information, by the way, as well. And it's, and it's in an encrypted, secure um, back end of the data. It's just small demographics. So right now, this is just a demographic. You can see when AI is integrated with it, eventually you'll be able to tailor it to substance and even self-monitoring symptom behaviors, like what coping skills might be best for someone that is rating depression highly over, say, anger management. They may get depression coping skills. So there's, there's a, a lot of opportunity for this to be like very sensitive and personalized to the client's needs. So when you first log in and you get you go through that small demographic uh, platform, then you'll you'll see like these two modules called substance use, this is for adult populations, and then emerging adults from 18 to 25. So the first module, when you click on it, you get 12 sessions of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that it's, um, it's that integrated CBT uh, integrated approach I was telling you about that focuses on substance use and anger management each session. The second um, module called Emerging Adults is uh, CBT that's developed and tailored for young adults who are having problems with depression and substance use. And so I'm collaborating with um, a, a, a professor out of UMass. She's um, K99R00 awardee. And so she's gonna be uh, deploying this in ER settings out of uh, UMass. And there's 12 sessions that she's gonna be doing with these young adults who are at risk for suicidal ideation and, and using substances and, and um, reporting depression. So after you see these modules, and for example, let's say we click on the substance use, it'll look like this, you'll get the 12 sessions. But before the client can actually go in and start to learn the coping skills, they have to fill out the weekly questions, which um, is right up here. That automatically occurs before they can even get into the platform. And it essentially looks like this. Um, there's no sound, they're just filling out the screeners, the self-monitoring. So to what degree are they craving substances? To what degree are they using substances? To what degree are they feeling angry? To what degree are they having conflict with a partner? To what degree are they getting aggressive with a partner? And, to what degree are they uh, experiencing um, partner violence as a, as a survivor or victim of IPD? To what degree 
are they having any medical problems? We developed some of the medical in here because um, actually some of the U of R cardiologists here, there's a lot of um, stress and depression with heart failure patients and hypertension. So we built that into the platform. <clears throat> to what degree are they feeling stressed during on edge, uh, feeling depressed or hopeless? On any medic, you know, compliant with their med med medication. Any stressors related to COVID? So this, we were building this, like literally started flying through developing this platform during COVID. Hello. So. Um, then before, after you take the, oops, let me pause this for a second so I can. Um, so after, oops, I gotta go back one. So after they complete the self-monitoring, the screeners, the weekly screeners, before they start doing their coping skills and getting into the topic areas, they can customize the avatar to their liking. So this is sort of what, it, what that looks like, like just showing you the different avatars. Oops. We're trying to introduce characters, clothing, skin and hair types that are gender fluid, that, uh, uh, that the, the, the client, the user can like customize to their liking. And then this is an example of just some of the, the avatar. Once they choose the topic, the topic uh, is sort of structured. It is structured just like manualized human administered CBT. A third of the session focuses on functional analysis, like what are the triggers for your maladaptive behavior within that module? And how did you do the week before? And then here's the new topic, what we're gonna cover and educate the client about. Um, and then here's a coping skill to practice. There's built in rewards. I'll, I'll show you some examples of that. And then like they take a quiz to, so we can assess if they're learning the material. An important first step is to know that it's not unusual for some people to have problems with anger. In fact, anger is a normal emotion when kept in check or channeled in healthy ways but what you do with the anger can lead to unhealthy behaviors. For example, if anger causes harm to another person, this can be unhealthy. We believe everyone can learn new and healthier ways to cope with substance use cravings and ways to manage anger or conflict. Conflict is unavoidable. Instead, healthy relationships have a balance of positive and negative events. So one way to move towards being in a healthy relationship with better communication is to increase positive communication and actions in your relationship. I'm going to... Okay, so that's an example of just the avatar narrating and educating about the content. It could be, you know, anger is a healthy emotion. Uh, it's when it leads to aggressive behavior that it becomes unhealthy and unhealthy conflict. So each session, just like CBT, it educates on the behavior when it becomes unhealthy, healthy and unhealthy. And then it, lead, then it goes into the coping strategies. So some of the user-friendly uh, assets of it is positive reinforcement. So we built in random positive affirmations like, great job, you're on your way to positive health and keep up the good work. Or there's confetti bursts um, when they're interacting and doing a coping skill. And there's also like trophies like or awards they win when they do each module so each topic they complete uh they win and they get an award for that and another uh so when they they do take one of the quizzes there's also a confetti burst and explanation when they get that right and there's pleasant sounds when they get something right and there's another example of some of these assets
People, places, situations, and emotions can all trigger an urge to lose control of your temper, which, in turn, can lead to aggressive behavior. What are your triggers? Substance use. How often do you lose control of your behavior and act out when you use substances? Anger. How often do you act out when you become very angry? Now that we're done, how helpful did you find the practice exercises in this session? And we always want to loop back with, uh, when I say uh, user, I mean our customer, to see if they're satisfied with the platform, if they found that particular practice exercise helpful or not. Because with the AI in the future, it can keep track of what coping skills led to positive treatment outcomes, meaning reductions in the problem behaviors. It can keep track and redeploy them should they start having problems again. So it showed you some of the graphics. Um, so this graph to the left, um, so the first one you can't, it's not, it's hard to see because it's white font below it, I apologize for that. But the first bar chart says cravings. So if you were to check, click on that bar chart that says cravings, this, the, the graph to the right will, can show craving, how they rated their craving across 12 weeks of treatment. So you can see if the cravings are going up and down. So the clinicians can see that, the, the patients can see that. And you can intervene if it looks like the cravings are start to increase. Um, you can possibly intervene and do more coping strategies, possibly higher level care, possibly medication management. It's just a graphic that um, they can both see. The same is true for substance use. You can click on that and see it across treatment that's going up or down. So it's a visualization and feedback. Um, anger, depression, it, all the different screeners that are done each week before they start the CBT modules, it'll show from week to week in graphic format. Um, it does generate a small interpretive report um, that you know can go back to uh, the clinician and the client or in placed in the medical record. So for example, I don't know if those of you have experience using psych testing, um, uh, Qualtr or not Qualtrics, um, Q Global um, or PAR or Pearson, where you have like the WACE or psych testing, you can get interpreter reports. This, it's not that extensive, but it's just a small one pager that like, we'll just say here are the demographics of the client and then the scores that they completed, it literally will highlight those in orange or red, like to pay attention to like cautionary. Um, like meaning they're getting high so that the clinician can be on alert. Um, so we we did take this, I, I talked about the alpha beta testing of all of this, but we just to like build the avatars, but then once it was built, we actually took it to outpatients and to inpatients and had them do some of the sessions and rate, like tell us about that. So uh, we did get a good feedback from them. Um, so out of 40 patients that were tested with us on outpatient and inpatient, um, they preferred this avatar platform to pencil and paper. They thought the avatar was genuine and relatable. They found it easy to use and rewarding. I thought the interesting finding to me was this enjoying the customization of the avatar. Only 50% reported enjoying the customization. So when we looked at the data and we asked them about it, they said the older clients said they just wanted a default character and they just wanted to hear the the coping skills from the default and then the younger clients were like we want to customize it we want to play with the avatar before we get into the cbt content so that was interesting to me because um you know i'll just say like the initial idea and concept in 2012 to build an avatar assisted platform came from my teenage son who was like you know playing video games and i was watching just enjoying the customizing the avatar and how they're spending all this time on it and i thought how cool would it be to that in the future we can kind of have a, a behavioral therapy coach, like not the therapist, but just a coach to do these practice exercises in between the therapy sessions. And, you know, these clients are going to get older, you know, and they be our clients or be our clients now and they're going to want options. You know, they're, they, they're familiar with tech, they're tech savvy, they, they just want options. So older clients, they were like, nah, just want to default. Your younger ones really like the interaction and you know, playing around with the character. Um, so 
currently right now, this is where we're at with the platform. Uh, this current, we have a NIH UG3, UH3 grant. What that is, it's, it's, it's like a kind of like an R01 stage 1A, B, but it's, it's why it's called a UG3, UH3 mechanism is because you have to work very closely with NIH and the FDA. And that has been like, it's, it's very challenging that FDA really treats this no different than a new medication on the market. Like it's investigational, we, they wanna make sure like patients know like it could, could this worsen substance? Yes, it can improve it, but can it worsen it? Like, so we have to work very closely with the FDA on all aspects of the development of it in, in this, these two, these trials. So year one through two is an efficacy trial to get IDE approval from the FDA, recruiting 40 patients. And then year three through five is an effectiveness study on 160 patients. So it's basically weekly substance use aggression and inclusion criteria is 18 to 65 years of age. It's alcohol and cocaine, alcohol and or cocaine, and a history of anger and conflict in the home. Now, when we first wrote, when I first wrote this grant, I really thought the Avatar platform was going to be superior to human administered. And when I sent it to NIH, I was shocked that they wrote back and they're like, no, 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 we don't want it to be better than the human. We just want it to be as good. So please. Our suggestion is to like edit that up a little bit. And I was like, okay. Uh, so the hypothesis is that avatar administered rich CBT will be as efficacious and effective as the human. So this is not to replace human clinicians. I, I truly believe you cannot, you absolutely cannot take the human out of the equation. But I feel like clinicians need tools like that they can give their clients use in between therapy sessions or if clients are waiting in the waiting room or if they're ER setting with long wait times, they can maybe be using some of these skills um, or clients that don't have access to any care. It's a way of providing care to them. Uh, so anyway, we're, we're hypothesizing that it'll be as good as the human. Um, we, there are small startup companies out there that have like wearables um, that look very similar like to the, um, like a smartwatch or a wearable, like the Garmin, uh, to measure cortisol, like in sweat, real time, continuous, but they're, they're not approachable. It's really not ready for market yet, but you can see how having other objective indicators other than the client's self-report, I mean, the gold standard we have right now for substance use is the breathalyzer and their urine toxicology screens, but really anxiety and depression to tap into like cortisol or other uh, biomarker research will be really important um, to try to advance the field, looking at genetics and, and other phenotyping, because there's research showing that if someone has a, you know, abnormalities in the comp gene, that they may be more uh, vulnerable to violence. And so maybe we can start thinking about what treatments to give depending on sort of what typologies of client we have to help improve their treatment outcomes. So wearables coupled with this type of digital therapy, I think is gonna be important in the future. Um, we are using some comfort bots for children, gaming type, um, educational prevention forums, like this like bottom right hand core um, is sort of like a Vive or um, a headset to educate kids about opioid overdose. And bottom left, um, is a 3D simulation tool. I'm gonna provide you with the link. It's free on our website that people can use that if you work with clients where you feel they have like, um, they have their alcohol use or substance use is having an effect on their medical, like they're either the cirrhotic liver, potential, the potential for cirrhotic liver or cognitive impairments. Um, we do have a tool that shows you what the healthy organ looks like and then when it becomes unhealthy, if they continue their use. And that is 3D. It's, it's meant to accompany motivational enhancement therapy as a medical motivator for change. So th this, um, if you're interested in that, you just type in Google FavTech at RET, click Outreach, 3D Organ, and you can hit the play button. And it literally will go through the liver, the um, lungs for pulmonary disease, um, that like what a neuron looks like healthy and, and um, neuronal death, it shows you and what behavioral symptoms to expect at different stages. So that is um, on there for people to use. And I provided the website for that as well. 
And just um, basically, the future is going to be, you know, co accompanying the human administered therapies as there's going to be more innovations in tech that help us sort of progress the field and help patients um, help them before they decompensate. So if we have some red flags are about to decompensate, what can we deploy to them in the moment that can help them? Okay, and uh, again, I just want to again thank Dr. Ben Lee and NIH and the RAT behavioral team, Drs. Arndt and Doolittle, uh, RAT's VP of Research, um, our core Department of Human Health, our personalized healthcare technology team, working man, it's a company, a developer team, and some uh, junior faculty, Dr. Kelly. So again, I, I do want to thank everybody and open it up for questions. Uh, if anyone has questions, because I, I realize that it does bring up a lot of issues, ethical issues, a lot of potential questions of having, you know, an innovative disruptor with some of these technologies. Okay. Thank you so much, Caroline, for the wonderful talk. And uh, I'm sure that this should lead to some discussions. Okay. And, uh, you know, like uh, one quick question before uh, people are entering their questions and getting ready. Uh, in your randomized clinical trial between the drug counseling and, uh, and, and the avatar-assisted CBT, are you planning to do any cost analysis? Uh, so we can do a cost analysis. Well, I did not have the PACSAT as part of the assessment battery, but we haven't started recruiting yet, so we could definitely add that. That, that, so That's a good curious. question. We, we do have an instrument called a PACSAT we could use it, that, that addresses cost effectiveness of the platform. Gotcha. And, uh, and I think some of the question that's being asked actually relates to this question. Uh, Bill Small uh, asked, uh, uh, I think it's actually a three-part question, but I'll focus on the two of them. One is related to the cost in relation to, you know, the concern about how this might be, you know, the, the, the direct quote is, what financial incentive does an organization have to employ professionals when they can employ cheaply more uh, like an avatar? But I think that the question is more asking about, you know, how should we, as a, a healthcare organization, think about this in is it going to replace us? Is the guy you think? Right. Yeah. No, that's, again, that, that's an outstanding question. I, it points to the ethics of our field as well. I do not believe you should. You can take the human out of the treatment of the client. There has to be oversight. And again, this is not to, this is not to replace the human therapist, but give them tools to use in their therapy setting, clinical setting. Um, so that's one part answer to that. I guess the second part is there are some startups that are doing all technology based and there's not a lot of human involvement. And I think that's risky. Um, but this is, I think the only time that we should think about is like a, if someone can't have any access to care and we find that this is evidence based, that this is like could be a, you know, a way to give care to people that just can't afford anything. Um, because these are low cost. Um, again, aside from startup companies, these are sort of free or low cost ways of treating them. Right, and I think, you know, uh, uh, you know, we have our wait list incredibly long. And at the same time, as uh, University of Rochester Medical Center also covers such a great big area, and uh, we really need some kind of technology-based solutions to deliver mental health to many of our rural and distant regions and some of these ideas are very important idea that we should really think about but another question that's being asked is that doesn't this also uh, leads to you know working with the avatar uh, looking at these computer-based technology-based uh, interaction uh, doesn't it also lead to like loneliness and isolation Right, yeah, you definitely don't want to enable isolation, but I think, you know, with the therapy content, even thinking about social anxieties, you can build in content into the platform for social anxiety or 
you know, autism spectrum that is designed for social skills training or reduce their anxiety by getting them out and doing a coping skill that gets them out of the house. So you could potentially use the technology as a venue to like decrease that maladaptive behavior. Got you, got you. And uh, any other question from the audience? Yeah. I just had a question. It sounds like there's therapists sort of on the back end who are looking at like the reports or whatever. How do you handle safety concerns if they come up or do they come up like if someone says they're suicidal or something like that? So that's an outstanding question. <laughs> we have in this avatar versus the human administered, there's a human before they go and sit down with the avatar and the human goes over all their you know, depression, suicidality risk scores, homicidality risk scores. It looks like the numbers have to like, they have to circle them and then they have to, if they're exp uh, endorsing no suicidality or homicidality, they sit down with the avatar platform. If they're having problems, they're gonna have to see a psychiatrist. Like we wouldn't use the platform with someone who's at high risk. So it sounds like there is a screening process that, yes. that you know, and that, that's a, uh, that's an approach that many of the, you know, nowadays on demand kind of healthcare, better health is another platform that's being utilized. It does seem to screen more severe issues upfront. So there's always need for human therapist or human intervention, now, at least for now. You have a follow up question? Yeah. Can I just ask a follow up? Yes. Screen in the middle or anything that's Yes, they touch base with the clinician before they leave. Okay. Yeah, that's a okay. good question. All right, other questions? I have a question. And it's, it's kind of similar to the question I was asked earlier, but at a different angle, right? We, <clears throat> for as long as I can remember, we've never had enough therapists to fill the positions that we have posted. And that's probably true in all behavioral health, substance use disorder, treatment organizations throughout the state, the country. Do you envision this being developed to the point where within a treatment setting that AI and human therapists are essentially partnering to be able to fill in some of those yeah, gaps no, and expand a, capacity? Right, that's an outstanding point. So two part response to that. Human, we know from the research that even if it's really rigorous and you're providing the human clinician with all the supervision, you're having them, you're giving them like reminder sheets on what evidence based content to cover for CBT and their tapes are rated and under these like strict rigorous research conditions. We still find that 40 about 40% 40 of the human therapists drift off content and it's because they're busy. They have a lot of clients. Maybe the client is bringing some new material into the session. So I do see it as a partnership that here's a tool that helps with treatment fidelity, adhering to the evidence based care and deploying and being competent and getting that dose of coping skill to the patient and that can be a tool in the therapy session. And so it can help get them the dose and the human therapist can attend more of the alliance. And also, um, you know, so that they can help, it can help with the dose of CBT and burnout. I believe this may help clinicians by giving them more tools to have in session. So that's just not one after the next client. And it's just, it's a lot vicarious trauma and other things that can lead to burnout with the clinician. So A, helps with treatment fidelity, may help with burnout. One, another question is coming from Will Pigeon, our, uh, our expert in, in, in CBT, and he, he's asking, uh, have you and your team began thinking about how to provide additional CBT add-ons for these population. Will Pizen, by the way, is an international expert in CBT insomnia. So yes. I think he's asking this. Yeah, this has the ability to be scalable to other maladaptive behaviors such as insomnia. Right now, uh, we, we do have a um, one of our researchers working on the content for psychosis. We have someone working on content for anxiety, depression. It's just the like time. We just have to get the content down and then we can we can integrate it into the platform. Have you thought about maybe doing this in uh, 
sort of different language as well. Uh, because I think yes. one of the pressing concerns is about linguistically isolated communities that really don't have any therapists available. So. Right. Absolutely. Well, we, so we have, by January, we should have this Spanish version of this. And we do have um, someone right now that's working on a Hindi version. Um, it, we, the software is, the technology, it's the landscape of technology is really fast right now. So you, there is software for linguistics, but it's not that accurate. So we're working on having humans translate and then back translate to make sure it's accurate. Other question? Yeah, Tara. students. So I'm curious that the technology is lovely, but when I think about comparison to other, like the video games that, that you mentioned your son plays, like the technology is out there and so much more advanced and, and perhaps engaging for, for a different audience. Um, so I'm curious about what involvement, if anything, the, the game design program at RIT has no, been. No, that's an outstanding question. You're ahead of the game here. It's not outside the scope. We, like, um, I don't know if I'm allowed to go back here. Uh, let's see. Sorry, let me try to find that menu of options. Um, where this cogwheel is, or right here, there's gonna be a new menu of games for relaxing coping skills and distracting coping skills, and those are game-based. And we are talking with a partner from another country who has expertise in that, but we do have, Obviously, you mentioned the game design program on, on campus, so, but these collaborations, um, I see us as building that out, especially for the younger populations that want, want that. Maybe so, just a couple more questions. Uh, Myra, do you want to just? Thank you, Myra. I've been anxious to share it. Um, and I really wanted to riff on Dr. Holter's comment, um, which is around the gamification of learning. Mm -hmm. um, I find that a lot of kids nowadays are become, there's an addictive quality actually to the gamification of learning. The urge to get that dopamine, you know, hit for every time that they kind of do a task rather than, you know, generating the positive self-esteem that comes from the experience of the learning process. So I'm curious what meta reflection there is around engaging in this positive reward system for participation and how that kind of mirrors some of the kind of dopamine issues in kind of substance use or other kind of um, disorders that you're looking to treat. We're just at the forefront of that now, understanding it. Um, but there is actually research in um, South Korea that's doing work on this and looking at fMRI and showing that um, there's positive uh, symptoms associated with that, not necessarily addiction, but like tapping into like a hypervigilance that can help learn the healthy behavior as opposed to getting addicted to the game game version, yeah. Okay, Myra. Um, thank you again, Dr. Easton, for the talk. Um, a question that I have related to treating patients with substance use disorder and this idea of access is also just engagement overall, mm -hmm. um, that really less than 10% of patients with substance use disorder are actually receiving any kind of treatment or seeking out treatment um, and so for innovations like this, I mean, we, we're thinking about how it might impact therapists and patients who are already engaged in treatment, um, but there are 90% of individuals who are not even looking to engage in treatment, let alone those who are seeking it out and having a difficulty finding it. So could you speak to how these innovations can help us tap into really that like 90% the patients with substance use disorders who aren't even looking for treatment, but may be attracted by something like an app on their phone. No, right. That's um, that's an outstanding question, and I hope to address world hunger next. No, seriously, I, I think that with through public service announcements and possibly using a version of this that ta is maybe an avatar-assisted motivational enhancement therapy through PSAs where they can go to a website and start to get motivated and then here, here are resources where you can go. Like, I, I think like that's an outstanding question, um, but I, I do feel like it would have to be some combination of like TV ads and 
other ads to get them to want to interact with a motivational enhancement version of this. Getting actually past the time. So we probably have to, I mean, we, I'll make her email address available so that you can uh, interact with her in a separate format. But thank you so much for your talk. And uh, you. I know the training will be around to interact with you a little more. Now, you know, overall, we don't know if this is a solution or not, but as an academic clinical department, it is our duty and responsibility to really investigate it and, and think about it and do research. So thank you so much for thank your you. pioneering thank work. You so, so much. I'm putting the QR, QR code.